Well, good morning. Thank you for the uh, invite and for rescuing us off the cool mountain this morning. It was six degrees when uh, I got up this morning and the, the bomb tells me it was a felt temperature of two degrees. <laughs> and then we hopped in the car to drive here this morning and we couldn't see any for fog. It's just one of those Toowoomba mornings, but you drop in off the range and it was all sunshine. So the sun never stops shining, does it? We need to remember that. Um, it's great to be here. It's been a little while. I think the last time we were here, it was um, your first Sunday back after you'd been shut down for COVID. So um, things have changed rapidly since then. Uh, it's our privilege this morning to share a little bit about uh, the ministry that God has called us to. And if you've had the newsletter we put out just this last week, um, circulated, then there's probably nothing much new to tell you this morning, except that I can't fit into a newsletter all the stories. And so this morning it's primarily, I'm going to mention a few more of those people that we have the great privilege of interacting with and sharing the gospel with, uh, if only mainly by correspondence. Um, I don't know about you, but as you uh, seek to share uh, the gospel, which is our primary mandate if you've still got breath in your lungs this morning, uh, then you've been left here for a reason. And that primary reason is to be an ambassador for Christ. Before he went back to glory, uh, he gave that mandate to his followers as disciples of him that we might encourage other people to also be a follower of Christ. But I don't know about you, uh, we're in pretty hard ground here and uh, rocky soil, and if the soil's hard, the hearts are even harder. And many times you try and share with people, and because we live in a society which is, although broken in so many ways, doesn't perhaps feel that brokenness as some, as some others, and so there tend to be, tends to be a resistance uh, to the gospel. But there is a harvest of souls, and uh, I want to encourage you this morning not to give up, because there is a harvest of souls happening right here in our city, uh, particularly in the prison ministry, and uh, I want to share a little bit about that. I think the problem in Australia is that, um, uh, and in many of the developed countries, if you like, um, we're renowned for, for, um, for being self-sufficient, and when we were once renowned for being a great sender of missionaries, we've tended to fall, in, fall into the trap of just relaxing. Instead of having a pioneering spirit, uh, I think we've tended to relax on our laurels a bit. And uh, when you get around talking to various mission organisations, one of the great uh, problems is that we, we tend to have just got too relaxed. And where once we were keen to go to the mission field and be missionaries, um, I think that has, uh, it's a problem we've just settled down. And so there's a great need. And uh, that's an emphasis, again, from the scriptures. We're told that we are to pray that more labourers be raised up into this great mission field. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a ministry where it's... Um, did you put some more gin in? Red cordial, is it? I can go for hours on red cordial. It's plain water. I'm never sure that I can trust Neil. <laughs> he has a wicked sense of humour. Um, we're to pray earnestly. That's the emphasis of that uh, scripture, to pray earnestly uh, because the labourers are needed. And someone asked me this morning, are you busy? And I said, well, we just seem to be getting busier. And um, I think when you're really busy, then you probably don't think too much about how busy you are. You just get up and you keep doing it each day. Uh, but before we get uh, specifically into what's happening in our uh, corner of the world, um, we'll talk a little bit about Emmaus Worldwide, and if you get our newsletters, then some of this is, is a bit old news. Uh, one of the great blessings is, uh, is modern technology. Uh, it can be an enemy to us, as we've heard about this morning, uh, with our PCs, and we have so much information on those, and there's a million people out there trying to get that off us, and they're very deceptive and very good at it. But there are positives, and so most people maybe today has a smartphone, so-called, um, but that's being used um, by Emmaus around the world and it's, it's creating uh, great opportunities, particularly as we see our world unravel. Um, when we had our first international uh, Zoom conference, 
um, we were told that this particular app and a PC-based Bible study, so the Emmaus courses and more and more of them are getting put onto this um, PC-based um, uh, system and more and more languages are being added to it, uh, it's reaching new people that we've never been able to reach before. So back in 21, September 21, we had that first uh, conference. There was 3,500 new students joining on that platform uh, every month. And I was wondering how that was going. And then we had, uh, we've had three, and our last um, get-together, uh, we were told that 6,500 students are joining every month. And these are people who are actually doing Bible studies, and many of them for the very first time, and many of them in countries that are closed or have been closed to the gospel. Um, also, we've mentioned this as well. Uh, in our last conference, we had 140 participants uh, from 64 countries, and it's quite exciting. I've got two monitors in my office, uh, fairly large monitors, because that's where I spend most of my life, looking at rectangular screens. That's why my eyes are shaped funny. And um, uh, we had both screens just full and I had to keep scrolling sideways to see the people from all over the world. And uh, if you've used the Zoom platform, you can have uh, various languages um, happening in, in language rooms. So you've got an interpreter and people drop out into their room and they interpret what's going on. Um, <clears throat> after the conference, um, which started at 11 o'clock my time, uh, PM, and went till about 1 a.m. the next morning, um, we had a breakout, and that was my breakout group. You can see me up the top there taking the photograph um, of the screen. And uh, the guy, I must point out, the guy down the bottom here with the little yellow around him, uh, he was in India, driving in Indian traffic and uh, still participating in our little breakout group. If you've ever been to India and tried to uh, navigate that traffic, this man was doing extremely well to participate in our breakout group, including pray. I said, I hope you don't close your eyes when you pray. But it was great. Because I'd been to India, I ended up uh, having a number of Indian uh, folk in our group. Uh, but the man in the middle that we've talked about is, um, is Yuri Yur, that guy there. And he's our um, uh, Emmaus director in the Ukraine. And this was just a month uh, prior to the war breaking out there. And it was wonderful to hear that man talk about uh, what he was hoping to do in that country and share the gospel. Um, it's a very orthodox uh, believing people, but not many people are Christian and don't have the true gospel. So he was very, very busy and he's talking about exciting things that they were doing in the Ukraine. And then, of course, the war broke out. And uh, we've been able to off and on keep in contact with him um, since uh, then, although we lost him for about a month or two. We thought uh, something may have tragic have happened to him. Um, but yes, as been mentioned this morning, uh, there's a terrible lot of stuff going on in the world and in that country there's awful devastation, but out of that there's still a great harvest of souls. See, God is able to bring great trophies of grace out of the ruins and uh, all of these uh, folk that are being, uh, leaving their country for their own safety, mainly women and children, um, there's over three million of them. Last time I spoke to our director in Poland, who are landed in Poland. And so they've taken up the opportunity and assembly halls like this have become havens and they've got families, uh, women and children all sleeping on the floor and they're bringing food to them. But most of all, they're sharing the gospel with them. And when we heard about this initially from our um, leader in Poland, he was telling me in an email that they were printing 15,000 copies of the gospel of John and a number of our Emmaus courses in the Ukrainian language, and they were handing them out and they were being devoured, and people were discovering the gospel uh, for the first time. A lot of them felt that they could never read the Bible. They'd been told they weren't able to read the Bible, only a priest could read the Bible. And here they've got a gospel, a part of the Bible, and they go, we can actually read it. And, and God has got great stuff to tell us about it, and many of them are coming to Christ. Um, so we felt a little bit exercised as uh, Emmaus Australia to share a small gift with them. And so we arranged to transfer that. Then as you may know, if you get our emails, I put that need out just in case someone else might like to uh, jump in and help with that. And we'd, we'd sort of thought to maybe put $1,000 towards it. Uh, I was blown away because I, I gave people about a week. I didn't want to hold the thing up. So I gave people about a week. And within a week, we had uh, $23,000 had been uh, put into that fund. 
There was a few people who didn't meet the deadline and wanted to add to that, so we opened it up again and we ended up sending about $31,000 Australian uh, to Poland just from our connection. So uh, I'm just so um, thrilled that people's hearts and minds and wallets were opened to participate into that. And uh, that little video um, isn't going to play for us, but it doesn't matter. It just shows their printing press. And they're now printing, uh, they've now, the last I spoke to them, they'd printed 60,000 copies of the Gospel of John and a number of the Ukrainian courses. So around the world, uh, Emmaus is having uh, great inroads into countries and there's great blessing as people are studying the Word of God. We've had a few people do a few courses in Australia in the community and have graduated, if you like, from doing a series of courses, but we don't get all excited about it here. Um, in many countries, they have a really big deal. If they've done 24 courses, they have big graduation ceremonies. But in, in countries like Sierra Leone and many places across Africa, many of the states of India, uh, DR Congo, around the world, there are thousands and thousands, about 1.5 million people a year are doing our Emmaus courses. And they have uh, big ceremonies to, to um, get all excited about that, and well they might. Uh, just quickly here. Uh, at home. Uh, it's hard to, um, to capture into words just what God's doing uh, in the lives of people that have not had an opportunity or have not had any desire to know about God. And every day as we open our mail and meet new people and hear their stories, it's just an incredible privilege that we have been given to share with people who want to know. Um, I don't know about you, but if you talk to your neighbour, you talk to someone that you might meet, you tend to get a bit of the cold shoulder. She's right, mate, you know, it's all right for you, but don't bother me with it. We're getting people actually asking us, you know, to explain God to them. What, what a great opportunity and privilege we have. So as a church here, you partner with us in that, and so we want to express our thanks to you. Um, as I said right at the start of when we got involved in this ministry in 2016, there was courses going out the door every day for free. There was a postage bill of around 800, now about $1,100 a month. And I kept going, how do you sustain this? It's like having a shop where you just open the door and say, come on in, everything's free. You know, then you've got to buy that stock and the next lot of stock you buy, you go, well, you can have this free as well. And that's how we operate. 85% uh, of what goes out the door goes out with no cost to the person who's receiving it. Um, but every time I get a little bit concerned about that, um, I can tell you so many stories about that. Uh, just last week we had a, uh, our postage bill come in, it was $1,145. And the day it came in, or the day after it came in, uh, I actually saw it come in on my phone at night, and the next morning and I opened our bank account up, someone who hadn't given for a long time gave a $1,000 gift to the ministry. And so I just see, you know, God walking ahead of us and enabling us to continue, and not only that, but richly blessing us. But there's lots of things that are challenging as well, and lots of changes happening all of the time. One of those changes came quite abruptly to us um, back in March. Um, Basil and Faith Connell have served in our, new, in our Sydney office, uh, been involved, uh, uh, certainly Faith has, in the Emmaus ministry for over 21 years. And uh, Basil has uh, helped her in that role. Uh, I got word from Faith that Basil wasn't well. Mind you, he was about 82 or something, and she's nearly 80, and they're still going into the office and doing, um, you know, whatever they can to, to do the sort of ministry that we're doing. And uh, Basil um, developed some poor health and went to hospital, and they found he had a very a unique sort of leukemia. And uh, I got a shock. I just opened my phone up one morning and there's a message there from Faith saying that Basil had passed into the presence of the Lord at four o'clock that morning. And uh, just to try and run the office on her own, um, she just felt she couldn't continue. And she basically said, you know, Bryson, um, I'm not just going to show what's happened, but, you know, I can't keep going. Uh, we have a full-time role as it is. And I'm thinking, okay, there's another office to take on. We cannot let this drop. We prayed about that and we were trying to work out ways that we could possibly um, bring their ministry into uh, dovetail with ours. Uh, and then in a couple, uh, David and Julie Ward, I don't have a better photograph than that, it's just a scanned photograph. 
Uh, they were working full time with the Riverston Assembly. Uh, they've stepped into that gap and they've moved the office from West Pennant Hills over to the Glow offices and he's trying to find his way and we're trying to help them out as much as we can as they transition into the role. So we thank God for them uh, because I was just a little bit panicking underneath my uh, cool exterior uh, as to how we were going to take on another office. Um, so we'll just try and help them as much as we can. And Faith is still now going into the office one day a week to help him uh, learn the ropes. Like everything, you know, you don't know what's involved until you actually start doing it. It looks easy from the outside, perhaps. <clears throat> Um, just talking about change, the other thing that's changing all the time, the, the courses are being reviewed constantly by our American office and you'll see just the covers are changing, they're reviewing the words in them um, where some words made some sense back in 2017 or earlier or 2004, they've had to update the language a bit, they're working on that all of the time to keep the, uh, the courses current. A big part of the ministry is the calendar ministry. And you'll notice from the figures up there that uh, each year, particularly in the prisons, it's growing. Uh, I was speaking to an inmate um, just last week. What's today? Sunday? Last week. And um, I'm getting old and losing track of days. Uh, and uh, he was saying that he's in a, he was in a prison with us, uh, built for 500 people, and there's 700 people uh, in that prison. Uh, the prisons are, are overwhelmed and uh, we as a society keep putting band-aids on the problems and it doesn't really fix the root cause. And so uh, crime is going through the roof. And, and some of the inmates that I'm getting to meet uh, through our ministry, it's astounding me uh, the sort of crimes that are, that are taking place. Um, but this is, a, this is a tremendous way. It's probably our best way other than with chaplains and other inmates sharing about the Emmaus ministry, the calendars. Uh, go into all of the prisons, every prisoner in Queensland and the Northern Territory and uh, pretty much across Australia, all, all across Western Australia, 16 prisons in Western Australia get calendars and in the calendars there's an offer to do the Bible study course and we send them those two little courses that are up in the corner there as introductory courses. So uh, last year we had an increase of uh, about 1,300 uh, required into the, into the prisons. Um, out of the total of calendars that we supply, 14, a bit over 14,000 go to prison inmates and they get them for free too. So if you would like to buy a calendar, the uh, little bit less than a dollar profit we make helps to contribute towards those uh, calendars that we send. The biggest challenge this year is freight. The freight costs are just going through the roof. So um, that's, that's going to be a, a challenge and we can't even get quotes for freight because they're going to add on fuel surcharges. So even if you think, because you have, might have a smartphone, that a calendar is not valued, they are by inmates. And um, not only that, if you happen to buy a calendar or you don't want a calendar, maybe you contribute towards the, the cost of the prison calendars. Very quickly, um, there's a sneak preview of the 23 calendar cover. We've got the artwork for that. And uh, we're thankful to Gordon Cowell, who does the big heavy lifting on producing those calendars for us. Um, just for your interest, January to May, um, that's the sort of figures that we're doing of calendars that are going out, uh, not calendars, courses that are going out. You'll see that uh, so far this year we've sent out 1,774 calendars, <laughs> let me go back to courses, to Emmaus courses. Um, we've marked 984 and commented on all of those. And 329 of the studies that have gone out have gone to new students. So these are people that we haven't had dealings with before. So it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity and we are so blessed to be involved in it. Uh, I've mentioned this man before and I probably talked about him last time we were here. He's been in jail for a while. He's one of our more high profile inmates and he doesn't mind me talking to you about him. I have his permission. Um, Paul uh, came to us uh, and his first course that he sent in, it asks whether you're a Christian or whether you have become a Christian during the study or if you'd like more information. He marked that he's always been a Christian. And I didn't let on and knew about him. I just said, uh, Paul, I've got bad news for you. Uh, you cannot have always been a Christian. You may have been a particular denomination, affiliation or whatever else, 
said, you can't have always been a Christian. And we got to explain the gospel to Paul and he'd never heard it explained. He always thought that if you were a religious person or tried to do the best you could, um, then that was sufficient. You'd sort of get over the line and hopefully everything would be okay. So we explained the gospel to him and early on we saw Paul come to know the Saviour. And uh, he has grown tremendously and he has a great concern for his family, his wife and his grown children, uh, that they too, they're religious and they really need to know the Saviour. Uh, he's currently made an application for parole and uh, he's waiting to see whether he'll get out on that. Uh, he's told us that the first thing he does when he gets out after meeting with his family is to make sure he catches up with Ruth and me for a, for a feed. So it'll be great to actually to meet Paul. Um, tremendous opportunities. Uh, this I'm not sure if you speak Vietnamese. Anyone speak Vietnamese or can read it? Um, I certainly can't. Uh, I got contacted by a chaplain uh, in one of the women's prisons. Said I've got a Vietnamese speaking lady in jail. She can virtually speak no English, um, and she's just crying day and night. It must be horrible for her. Um, one being in jail but not being able to understand anybody, instructions or anything else and she was just crying all the time. Uh, I'll try and make the story as short as I can but we end up contacting uh, our Vietnamese office who the guy that ran it had to get out of the country, his life was under threat and he ended up being, I tracked him down to South Korea, um, some people wonder what I do all day. Um, <laughs> And uh, he said, well, what I can do is I can send you the files and you can print them off and you can send them into the prison. And when she fills them out, uh, you can scan them and send them back to me and I'll comment on them. And he discovered very on, early on this lady was Roman Catholic but wasn't a Christian. And during the time of this going backwards and forwards, um, that lady became a Christian. She's now released and uh, she's speaking more English now and she's doing really, really well. She keeps in contact with the chaplain as a contact, as the chaplain does with her. Um, since then, uh, there's been another lady coming to the same jail, a Vietnamese speaking lady, and so we're starting the whole process again. So we've got opportunities uh, and thankful for the backup we get. Now this is um, a story that we've shared a number of times and I've got the great joy of giving you an update on it and if you read the newsletter you'll have seen a bit of that update. Uh, this is a man that we referred to in our newsletters originally as Arthur and uh, I can now tell you his name is Armin and um, that's the first uh, course I got from him or one of the very first. Um, his response to the gospel was he could see no lesson uh, in this course. Um, uh, the, the words meant nothing to him and um, faith in Jesus was just words on a page. It meant nothing to him. Very intelligent man and uh, I went into an arm wrestle with him and lost and uh, finally handed him over to God. And, um, and that man got gloriously saved in early 2017. He's done 13 years in jail as a violent uh, offender. He's um, been in there for... for um, grievous bodily harm and a number of other things. Well, he's just been released and I knew he was getting out but I didn't know where he was going. I'd advised him to get in contact with the church and whatever else. Lost track of him as to where he was um, or where he was going and all of a sudden I got a donation came into our bank account via PayPal and uh, it had an email address which had his name in it and I went, that's got to be the same guy. So I emailed him straight back and said, yeah, where are you, Armin? And he said, I'm actually in Toowoomba. So uh, I contacted him and said, we need to catch up, you know, so how about we go and have a feed? So I caught up with him and uh, he sent me a photograph of himself so I could actually recognise him. And when I went down to pick him up, he was walking on the side of the road and I thought, man, that's a big guy. And then he turned around and I thought, that's the guy in the picture. So um, Armin uh, uh, come and jumped in the car and we took him out for a meal uh, with a chat over a whole stack of stuff and um, it, it is, I just sat there and thought what, what a tremendous privilege to share the Lord with this man and see a transformed life just sitting in front of you, a man who's, he's a big man, Ruth likes him when he stands beside me, it makes me look small, like he, he would take your head off your shoulders if he wanted to, a big guy. Uh, but he did 95 of our courses while he was in jail and we put him on an equip program and he'd done 62 courses in that, averaging 98.6%. So when I finished the, uh, the meal, 
uh, with him, I took him back to our office, which is underneath our church building. And I walked him through our church deliberately and explained how we sort of do church. I said, any time you'd like to come along, uh, I'd love to bring you along. And, and, and he's, he's having trouble transitioning. He's been 13 years in jail. So he says, when do you start? And I said, oh, about 9.30. And he said, I'd like to come. So that next Sunday, I took him to church and I, present, I said to him, um, would you mind if I presented you with this special certificate? And he said, no, that'd be okay. So he came out the front and introduced him to the church and everyone was so friendly to him. And he, as I was taking him home, he said, um, I really enjoyed that. And uh, we've had another feed last week, took him out and had a feed. I tell you what, he can devour a big meal real quick. <laughs> um, just to give you an idea, I showed you what he wrote first of all. Uh, faith in Jesus means nothing to me. I won't take the time to uh, read a lot of his responses, but this is one of his last courses he did, and it was the course from Jerusalem to Babylon. He sort of moved up a little bit from the basic ones. And the question is asked in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, Saul was rejected as king and David was chosen. And read this section. David was a man after God's own heart. What do you think that means? This is Armand's answer. David had an unchangeable belief in the faithful and forgiving nature of God. He sinned, but was quick to confess, and his confessions were heartfelt, and his repentance was genuine. David never took God's forgiveness lightly or his blessings for granted. David experienced the joy of forgiveness even when he had to suffer the consequences of his sins. David didn't sin repeatedly, but learned from his mistakes because he accepted the suffering they brought. Um, I used to sit there and just almost weep as I read his responses and to meet him. A lot of people ask me, do you keep in contact with inmates when they're released? Um, some do and some don't. Uh, I had a phone call a couple of days ago from a guy who's been out for two years now. I said to him, John, are you sitting down? And he said, why? Um, I said, I've actually bought a fishing kayak. Um, I might be able to, you know, land a fish. I knew he's a mad king fisherman. He said, I'll come up one day and I'll show you how to fish. And I said, well, I got to teach you the scriptures so you can teach me how to fish. So I'm looking forward. He'll come up and he'll, we'll spend the day at one of the dams and hopefully he can catch a fish for me. Um, but, yeah, we do. Sean is another guy. He's been in jail for a while. Somebody, I have to sit, I say this carefully. Um, out of all the people who tick that they are a Christian uh, as in their first course, most of them are Catholic. Uh, and the other group that I, I don't offend anybody here, but the other group that I get commonly uh, across the desk are people from a Pentecostal background who say they're Christian and very soon into the course, I discover they're not. Uh, and I think the main reason is that they've probably put their hand up in some sort of an emotional experience and they've put their hand up to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. Then they try to live that life without being born again. And uh, it's, it's a battle. And this is a man, he's the son of a Pentecostal pastor, grew up in the church, said he was a Christian. About three courses in, I discovered that this man knew nothing. He was such, he was so in the dark. And so we just started it at grassroots and, and found out that he wasn't a Christian at all. And we saw Sean get saved. He was released last Monday and I put him in touch with a church in Nambour and the pastor got straight back to me and said, we'll uh, give him all the help he can get. So that's really important that they have that sort of help when they get out. Um, my time is rushing. Is it half past we finish? Okay. Um, I could tell you story after story of those we meet. A couple, just I'll mention, in regard to the sort of people. I think I've come across people who have done some of the worst crimes and you tend to get used to it, sadly. You tend to get used to it and it takes a bit to shock you. Um, but I did get one uh, a couple of months ago from a guy and uh, when I read his name, I thought, gee, that name is familiar. And he talked about his experience. He opened up about what was happening to him. He, he was on suicide watch. He cried day and night. He asked me to pray for his wife um, and I discovered, and uh, you may recognise it, it's a fairly local uh, crime that took place. This man actually uh, poured accelerant over his wife and burned her to death 
and uh, their three little children from nine down to three watched their mother die. Uh, he caught fire himself and he jumped in the pool to save his life. Uh, he comes across our desk and um, he, he's, a, he's a busted up man, busted up for a lot of reasons. Um, and he's asking for help. He wants me to pray to his wife for him and all those sorts of things. Where, where do you go with that? My, my hair stands up on the back of my neck and I go, you rotten cow, you, know, you, you deserve to be forgotten about. You know, lock him up, throw away the key. And then I thought about the song that we sang about the last song we sang. You know, the, our own wretchedness. What right have I got to the grace of God? If I understood my own sin like God sees sin, I'm as guilty and as worthy of hell as that man is. So where do I go with that? I tell him his only hope is, and the only way forward for him is to fall at the foot of the cross, acknowledging his desperate sinnership, and there he might find mercy. And after two or three courses and trying to get that through to him, that God, who knows all about him, is still willing to forgive him. That man has given his heart to the Lord and it's changed him. I can see it in the way he writes, in his appreciation for the Bible and he's just sinking himself into the scripture to learn more and more. He said, teach me everything you know. And I go, well, that's about that much. But if I can point you to the scriptures, then the spirit of God will teach you and he's just soaking it up. Another man who's in jail because of manslaughter, um, you have another higher profile case, um, he jumped out of a little childcare bus up in North Queensland and left a child on board and a little child died. Uh, he is an atheist. He came to us an atheist. He's a broken man. His whole life has changed. He wasn't meant to be driving the bus that morning. He was the director of the centre. The person who drove the bus didn't turn up. He jumped in the bus. He did the trip quickly. He had a meeting to get to. He jumped out, left it to the other lady to look after it. it didn't get done, but as the director, he's in jail for manslaughter came to us as a atheist but thought he would just fill in the time by doing a Bible study or two. Uh, he was hard yakka for a while and, uh, but that man's become a Christian as well. In fact, one of the chaplains rang me and she said, I, went into, I, I hadn't heard from him for a little bit and I said, can you go and check on him? And she did and she, she contacted me and she said, I went and saw him uh, with another training chaplain and we sat down at the table with him and he just told us his testimony, how he'd come to know the Saviour. And so we both just wept. See, God is in the business <laughs> of saving to the uttermost, the uttermost. I want to leave you with a little bit more of a, um, well, I hope all of that was positive and helpful. Um, a couple of weekends ago, we had a federal election. Does anyone remember that? And you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing all these people you'd never seen before or rarely saw and all of a sudden they're all telling us what they're going to do for us. And I got up the next morning, the Sunday morning, and it was one of those Toowoomba mornings. You know, I got up fairly early and I pulled the curtain back and it was drizzly and just grey skies and it was like, you know, the day you want to stay in your jammies, you know. And um, I'm not sure what side of the political divide you might be on, but, you know... Um, there was a few people a bit disappointed with how things went, maybe. And I closed the curtain and I went into my study and I came back out about an hour later, pulled the curtain back, and in the southwest, where we don't often see it, was this most brilliant rainbow. And it stayed there for about an hour. We always get them over in the east. And out in amongst all this fog and cloud was this most brilliant, from there to there, rainbow. And it reminded me that whatever goes on down here, you know, wherever we're looking out and seeing brokenness and disasters and war and all that stuff, God is, got it. God's in charge. He puts people on thrones and he pulls them off and we as God's people need to get grounded on that again. And I thought about this word as I was um, thinking about that and I'll leave you with it. It's preeminent. And you'll get this in a little verse in the Paul's letter to the Colossians. Now, I've got a half an hour sermon to go. We're going to get through this really quick. Um, if you know it, I won't take all the time to read it, 
uh, but it's Colossians 1, 15 to 20, and it spa- starts off, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, etc. And we come down to uh, this next part of the verse, and it's uh, this passage, and it says, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. If you've got your Bible out and went through with an underliner or a highlighter, wherever you like to mark your Bible, what will stand out to you in this little passage, this little section in this first chapter of Colossians, is these little phrases. He is, in him, through him, and by him. <laughs> I reckon as Paul was writing, his heart was just flooded with, the, with the, this, this idea that, that this person, Christ the one who is so precious to us, he is preeminent in all things. And Paul can't emphasise him enough. One of our students that I marked just last week, the question was, what is your response when you consider all God has created? And he, he's a bit of a character, this guy, and he said, I'll answer this with a meme. And he, wrote a stick, he drew a stick person standing up and he drew a stick person lying flat on its back. And I think what he was trying to say to me say to me was that when you consider all that God has created, it just knocks you flat. And I think we need to be knocked flat again as we think about the preeminence of Christ. It's an amazing little word. It comes from this Greek word, and you can pronounce it if you like. Uh, you'd be good at that, Neil. Uh, but it just means to be first in rank or in influence. It only appears once in the King James Version of the Bible. It, so you'd have to say, well, if it only appears once, does it mean it's not very important? Or does it mean that it's so important that God only has to say it once? I would go with the latter. But God wants us to know and be assured again this morning that he is preeminent. And if we focus it on this verse... I think as we think about what goes before it, when he talks about he's the, in, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, as we think about the historical aspect of him, we just admire him. We, we just see that he's so bigger than any one of us or any one of our situations. He is before all things. He created all things. And we just look at it and we go, I can't understand it, but we just find ourselves in absolute admiration as we think about him. As we think about the passage before us, um, it's just there for our encouragement, I think. He is the head of the body, the church. In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And so I trust it's a source of hope for us all as God's people. Um, Positionally, we're now holy and blameless. That's one of the things that I have great difficulty getting across to our students who have done the most horrendous crimes and they've come to faith in Christ and we're now able to say to them, in Christ, God sees you as blameless. He sees you as one of his own precious children. And for them to realise that, it blows them away. In a meme, it knocks them flat. Why doesn't it knock us flat? That God looks at me and has received me, the all preeminent one, the one who is above all things, and yet he invites us right into his very presence. I was thinking as, uh, as uh, we were praying this morning and doing the pastoral prayer, it's not like banging on God's door saying, oh God, you know, we've got these things happening in our world, would you come in? It, it, it's not like that. When we come to him in prayer, it's like we've got a one-on-one with him and we're sitting knee to knee to him and he's looking into our eyes and he says, dear child, tell me what's on your heart. That's how close we are. That's how close we've been brought in Christ to this one who is preeminent in all things. He is mighty and he is great. The psalmist said, but I, though through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house I will bow down toward your holy temple and I will fear you. There's a sense of reverence that's required when we come before this one who is all preeminent. He is great in patience. I thank God for that. He is eminent in authority and his priesthood surpasses all others. We have a great high priest. The psalmist again says, Your righteousness, O God, it reaches the high heavens 
You who have done great things, O God, who is like you. He is infinite. He's preeminent. He is worthy of our praise. I leave you with this this morning. He is worthy of everything we have. He ought to have the preeminence and first place in the affections of our hearts and the highest praises on our lips. As I've been able to share a little bit this morning, the journey of people who have met the Saviour, come to him in all their wretchedness and realised that he is everything. To have a man who was a outlaw bikey gang leader who took four prison guards to move him from one place to another, so violent, he ran the jail. Next thing he's sitting in a cell and reading his Bible and everybody wants to be around him. He's a, still a protector in the jail. Uh, one chaplain told me that this guy came in to the jail. He's just a little fella, um, a bit of a geek. Um, he'd never been to jail before and everyone was picking on him. And uh, so the chaplain went and saw this ex-bikey guy and said, would you keep an eye out for him? Uh, next time the chaplain went into the jail, uh, this guy said, do you know what, do you know when you prayed for me last time? He said, everybody's left me alone now. Everyone's being nice to me. Because this ex-bikey gang leader who's now become a Christian just looked out for him. And uh, he's a great testimony to all of those in the jail to see what God does in people's lives. So I trust we're encouraged. Uh, don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Keep shining your light in your corner of this dark world because he is preeminent. He's in control. And if there's someone who needs to be saved in your circle of influence, don't give up on them. Don't give up on them. I took Armin into my office and I said, see that desk, Armin, where I sit? One Sunday afternoon, I sat at that desk. I put my head in my hands and I wept for you. And I said, I said to God, that man is too hard. You can have him. He said, you should have done that a lot earlier. <laughs> Do I close in prayer or to someone else? Okay. Let's just come before him. Father, it does us well this morning to speak well of you. You are the preeminent one. You are the saviour of sinners. Christ loved the world. He gave himself for us. Father, we, as we speak of these great trophies of grace, we look within our own hearts and we thank you for your saving grace in our own lives. Many of us were in perhaps a place of privilege where we heard the gospel from an early age. Maybe there's some aren't. But Father, we've all come to that point where we had to acknowledge our desperate need and that you were the only answer into that need. So Father, even though you were in a place where you thought it not a thing to be grasped at, equality with God, the one who Isaiah saw as the one high and lifted up, that one came into this world, descended into the world and inevitably and ultimately gave his life on a cross of shame so that we might know sins forgiven. Father, we pray that we as a, not a sense of honour or even duty, but as a sense of love and worship to you this morning, shortly we'll be coming around yourself to reflect again on the cost of our redemption. And so this morning, we again offer our thanks for the one who gave himself for us. We thank you for all that you are doing in the world today, in the darkest corners of our globe. The light of the gospel is shining. And so we thank you for that as we give thanks in his lovely name. Amen.